Good morning. The epistle of 1 John has to do with assurance. How can a person have confidence, comfort, and peace in this life knowing that someday, very soon, we will all have to stand before the bar of God. I was thinking about this question a lot this week, reading through this passage, thinking about how, as I was a child, my mother used to call me a worrywart because I was always worried about so many things. It was difficult for me to have confidence about anything assurance about, especially assurance about the future. And the older I get, now I'm in my late 30s, I'm actually seeing more and more people that I know who are dying. I'm not saying that I'm an old person, all right? But I do see more and more people dying now than I did when I was in my 20s or in my teens. And now that I'm a parent, and I see my young child and how many dangers are all around him. If I did not have confidence in God, it would drive me, especially me, and and the way way God has uh, made my personality, and I'm not blaming him, but uh, I'm sort of an uptight person. It would make me literally crazy being the parent of a, a young infant. I was sitting the other day with Martin, and he was playing, and he was holding on to some toy, and this big toy, and he's, he's very strong for ten and a half months. Uh, he's fat, but also strong. And, <laughs> and he was holding on to this toy, and he started to tip backwards and pull the toy, this big kind of thing, on top of him. And there was a wooden table with a corner that his head was going right towards. And like Spider-Man, I... Phew, I reached out and caught his head at the last moment. My heart was racing, and he had no idea how close he was to smacking his head on the corner of a table. And I thought, oh, what if I wasn't sitting here? My son, my little infant baby boy, would have cracked his head open. I think um, that's at least something about what John Newton had in mind when he said, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. At least least in part, there's so many dangers in this world, and there's so many ways to be injured or even to die, and our life is not guaranteed to us tomorrow. And, And so how can we truly have confidence? How can we have assurance and peace? knowing that even though tomorrow is not promised to us, we can stand on the promises of God and not be afraid of whatever the future holds. This question is of the utmost importance. We do not come to church to have our ears tickled. We come to church this Sunday morning to have conference with God, to hear from God, to hear from His words to us, to receive His promises, to worship Him, to have fellowship with each other. And so as John begins the conclusion of his epistle now, he gives us the answers that we need to this question. We can indeed have confidence, comfort, and peace that we so desperately desire. It's found only in one place, the person of Jesus Christ. Whoever has Christ has life. May God help us to see that even more clearly this morning. Let us pray. Oh, Father, I know that not everyone is as tightly wound as I am, but we all need this message. We all need this message, Lord, that if we have you, we have life. We can have peace. We can have assurance and confidence knowing that we belong to the Lord, that He always has our best interest in mind. And that if we belong to Him, no matter what happens, we know that we can never 
lose him, and he will never lose us. Oh, Lord, speak to us now through your word, the Bible. Help us to receive it and believe it and trust in your holy word and live for the glory of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commands. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Verse 1 here is very similar to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, where it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. And now this same author says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. It's when we believe in Jesus as our Christ that we become part of God's family and not before that moment. That is the point of our adoption into God's family. I remember once an acquaintance of mine asked me if I would go with him to the gay pride parade. And when I politely turned him down, he said, Why not? Aren't we all God's children? Very kind of snidely said that to me. And I said to him, Actually, no, not everyone is a child of God. We become a child of God by adoption through faith in Jesus Christ. And then when that happens, when we become children of God, one of the evidences of that new birth, of that adoption into God's family, John says, is that we love the brethren, that we love God's church. By this we know, uh, it says here, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commands. All who belong to Christ must love the brethren. Listen now, this is very important. There is perhaps a way and a time to rightly and in an encouraging way critique things that happen in the church. All right, because no church is perfect. We're not going to be perfect until we are in heaven. That will be the perfect church without any more sins. We will have, uh, be together, says Hebrews 12, with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. See, right now we're the spirits of the righteous if we belong to Jesus Christ, if we love him. We are righteous. He's declared us as righteous, but we are not yet perfected. We are not yet glorified. And so church is going to be messy. It's going to be messy. We're going to sin against each other sometimes. We're not going to be the kind of people that we are going to be in heaven. Now we're trying and praying and loving and serving and hopefully growing to be more like Jesus. But church is going to be messy until we get there. It is. Nevertheless, for all the problems that the church has, and this church is no exception, we got some problems. Okay. One of the marks of being a true Christian is that you love the church, that you have a deep-seated, deep-rooted heart filled with love toward God's people. You love God's children. You love the brethren. You know that the church is not your idea. It's God's idea. It's not a human invention. Jesus created the church. And I think sometimes Christians can become sinfully critical of the church and not love the church like they should. And certainly the world doesn't love the church. The world hates the church. Jesus says that since they hated him, they would hate the church too. They would hate us. 
But if you are born again, you will have love toward the other children of God. Search your heart now. Examine your life. Examine your heart. Do you love Crossview Church? I don't mean just the capital C church. I mean this church. Do you love the people here? Amen. Amen. Do you love the people here? Do you want to be around them, serve them? There's a famous quote that Gandhi said. Maybe some of you remember this. Gandhi said, I like the Christ, but I don't like Christians. Yes, that is proof that he's not born again. Okay, that's proof. That's proof he's not a child of God. You can't like Christ and not like Christians. We must love and show love to everyone, but especially to our brothers and sisters in the faith. We are going, friends, to spend eternity together, so you had better get used to me. Right, like forever. <laughs> I don't know. You're not going to like move to the other side of heaven to get away from me now. All right? It's not going to be like that there. We better get used to each other. So how do I know if I'm really loving the children of God? Verses 2 and 3 says, By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Obedience to God's commands is the proof of our love. One writer aptly put it this way. There are people who do this. You call me master, but obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me the way, but you walk not in it. You call me wise, but you follow me not. You call me rich, but you ask me not. You call me eternal, but you seek me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me mighty and honor me not. You call me life and desire me not. You call me just, but you fear me not. And so if I condemn you, blame me not. You see, what that author is talking about is a person who just gives verbal assent to mere teachings or some intellectual assent to the doctrines of Christianity, but they don't know Christ Deeply, They don't know him savingly in their heart, and thus they don't obey him. They just give lip service. Their hearts are far from them. But Romans 13, 9 to 10 says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. See, if you really love the church really love the brethren, that's how you're going to be living then. Why does he say love is a fulfillment of the law? Well, because if you love someone, you're not going to steal from them. Otherwise, it's proof that you don't love them. If you love someone, you're not going to kill them. If you love someone, you're not going to steal their spouse. Okay? You may love both positively and negatively. There's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. There's also was what many call the silver rule. Do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. Okay? We can love positively and negatively by not wronging others and positively by caring for and helping each other. And it's not just an emotional feeling like the world says. Love is a verb. And this command to love is not burdensome to the Christian. In fact, it's natural to the new nature. To the natural and regenerate man, it's impossible but to the new man, to the believer, it's what your heart actually desires. Do you actually desire to serve each other, to love each other? Mm. Because the world says, me first, revenge on those who wrong me, rebel against God, hate those who are different, worship me, for I am the center of the universe. But the Christian is a new man who no longer belongs to this world. We were bought at a price. We were purchased by the blood of Jesus. And so the Christian says, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to forgive those who wrong me. I want to serve God. I want to love those who are different from me. I want to worship the Lord, for He is the God and center and creator of the universe. Yes, yes, that's what true Christianity looks like. And so look at what John says in the next two verses here. 
For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? When Shimon bar Jonah, also known as Peter, made his confession that he believed Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock I will build my church, and the church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You see, the Roman church believes that Peter himself is the one that Jesus was talking to, that Peter is the rock. But in the context of Matthew 16, it's very clear that Peter's faith in Jesus, that is the foundation and the rock that the church is built on. Faith. Jesus said that the gates of hell will not overcome the church. And here in, verse, in 1 John chapter 5, it says that the church overcomes the world. And so when Jesus says that the gates of hell will not overcome the church, I think so many times we take that as a defensive illustration. The gates of hell will not overcome us. Hell is always attacking the church. But the church is going to stand and we don't have to be afraid. Even though hell and all of the demons of hell always try to discourage us and attack us and their minions try to come after us, the gates of hell won't overcome us. But actually, friends, this is not a defensive illustration. It's an offensive illustration. Why do I say that? What does that mean? Because you don't bring the gates of your city to a fight. The fight comes to the gates of the city. Do you understand that? The fight comes to the gates of the city. When you're going to go out in a battle, you don't carry the gates of your city with you and then go into the battle, do you? No. So when Jesus says that the gates of hell will not overcome the church, this is offensive. This is offensive. We are the army of God. In a spiritual sense, we are the army of God. We are attacking, attacking, attacking the gates of hell. And the gates of hell will not stand against the church. The church breaks through them. Amen. And no matter how many are hell's captives, Christ has a remnant. He has a remnant. He wants you to share the good news of the gospel with them. And so he says, the church overcomes, overwhelms. This is the victory that has overcome the world. We overcome the world. We overcome the gates of hell. I. Howard Marshall writes, the power that enables believers to overcome false prophets in chapter 4 also enables us to overcome the world with all of its temptations. And what is this power? The means of our victory is faith. The fact that we hold true faith in Jesus is the means whereby His power operates in us and enables us to overcome the world. Isn't it striking that John says that we have already overcome the world? He does not say we will overcome the world. It's because Jesus has already won the battle for us. When He died on the cross and rose from the dead, the battle is already won. Amen. It's already won. We need to believe that, know that, claim the victory in Christ. I was just watching a, a video the other day that somebody posted on Facebook. I mean, I, I think that this is appropriate here for this context because this video that this person posted was about overcoming addiction to pornography and what the person in the video said was this if you're a believer in Jesus Christ here is the solution it's not a 10-step program it's not where you do this and this and this and then you can overcome no 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 here it is stop it that's the solution just stop it okay Stop looking at it. Stop clicking on it. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you have the power to do so. He gives you an escape from that temptation. Do you understand that? You have an escape. 
If you belong to Jesus Christ, the chains of addiction are broken. They are broken. So the answer is, stop it. You don't have to go through some kind of 10-step program. Just say, Lord, I'm going to stop and do it. But pastor, you don't know how difficult it is. I know how difficult addiction is to anything. Sure, sure. Not saying it's going to be easy. But I am saying this. We have faith that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Don't tell me that something is too difficult for the Christian to do. Some temptation is too difficult for you. Don't tell me that. If that's the case, then you don't have the victory that Christ already provided. You understand? And if you don't have the victory that Christ already provided, then maybe that's an evidence that you don't belong to him. Now, I'm not saying that Christians don't struggle with things. I'm not saying that there aren't besetting sins that attack us and that it takes time for us to even realize that the battle is already won. But listen now, if you know Jesus, the battle is already won. Now you just need to obey. And so in what ways do we overcome the world? I want to give you three applications here. Ways that we overcome the world. The first has to do with what I just said. We overcome the world's temptations. Okay. Christians are granted with the piercing eyes of faith with which we are able to scan the world's shallowness and see through the mist of error into the glorious kingdom of God. By faith, we see the emptiness of the world's promises of happiness. Did we learn about that last week while I was gone? Did you pay attention to Pastor Mike's message? Saying this world has nothing that can give you true, deep, abiding peace and happiness. It is a lie. And when the world promises that to you, it is lying to you. And it, the world's lie is so convincing. Why is that? Well, because how many of you have uh, been outside of your flesh before? Uh, none of us, all right? We are born, at least not yet, we are born into this world. We grew up in this world. We are a product of this world until we're born again. And so the world and its promises speak to us, speak to our nature and our, the natural man. And it seems like, well, these promises hold some weight and value. And they actually are able to give some temporary momentary pleasure. But the world cannot give you peace and cannot give you lasting happiness and cannot give you a foundation that can never be taken away. The world can't do that. That's only found in one place, Jesus Christ. And if you have that foundation, if you have that, then you can see, then you can see, ah, the world's lied to me. All these empty promises of all this happiness and joy and pleasure that I was going to get by the world, it's all a lie. It's all a lie. The Lord has opened up your eyes and your mind to be able to see that, that Christ is the one in whom we can have true satisfaction. He is truly the one who can give us happiness and joy. And we're able to overcome the world's temptations then. All right. That's how we're able to. In the example that I just gave previous to this just now, that's how you can overcome something like pornography, you know. I only bring that up because I know how much of a scourge that is on our society. There was a time when a person had to go to a store physically and show their face to some kind of a teller and purchase that smut. And now a person can sit in the privacy of their home, and no one sees their face anymore, and it, it, it has become so easy. But it's a lie. It's a lie that that can give you what you're looking for. It absolutely can not. And as a matter of fact, it will only bring you something else. It will only bring you ruin, and it will only bring you, you ruin to your marriage, and it will bring you ruin to your spiritual life. And in the end, it will bring you ruin when you face the Lord. So 
all of the sexually immoral. Their place is the lake of burning fire. It's terrifying. And you know, I didn't even have that in my notes. It's just something that's been on my heart. It's been on my heart a lot because I know what a scourge it is in this society. We overcome the world and its temptations. Second, we overcome the world's hatred of us. In A.D. 298, it looked as if the Roman Emperor Diocletian was going to destroy the Christian faith from the earth. He took Christians and cut their tongues out. He boiled them in oil. He threw them into the sea. In the Colosseum, they threw Christians to the lions. Diocletian imprisoned the preachers, murdered the believers, took their books and burned them to ashes. In fact, he erected a pillar in Rome. And on the pillar, it was written in Latin, Extincta Nomina Christianorum, which means the name of Christ is extinct. And the church says a collective, ha! Do you understand? The church can never be extinct. The church of Christ will never die because we belong to the one who lives forever and we overcome the world's hatred of us with love through many dangers, toils, and snares. We have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. We never have to be afraid of the world overcoming God's church and killing the believers and us being alone. Last week I actually preached a message at the Village Church of Barrington that I preached here once, Lador Vador, in 1 Kings, when Elijah was running away from Jezebel. And he said to the Lord, I alone am left and they're trying to take my life too. And the Lord said to him, not so. I have preserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. See, God has his people all over the place. It is, a far more, it is far more numerous than we even have understanding. We don't know how many places and how many people the Lord has preserved for himself. It's a remnant, but it's a greater number than any man can count. And so we overcome the world's hatred of us. We overcome its temptations. We overcome its hatred of us. Third, we overcome the world's end. The way of the world always ends in death. Romans 8, 6, the mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. At the end of the worldly man's life, there is only death and hell that awaits him. But at the end of the Christian's life, there is life because the Christian belongs to the author of life. We overcome the world's end. Listen, this is so profound. This is so wonderful. We have to grasp it. Hold on to it. Listen now. As the Christian is falling down into his grave, as his life is ending, and he's taking his last breath, he takes his first breath in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> All right. All right. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. He is falling down, and now he's alive again. <laughs> All right? That's, that's what Jesus is saying in John chapter 11, my favorite verses in the Bible. John chapter 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. See, he's saying we will live even though we die, right? Do Christians die? Have you ever seen a Christian die before? Yes, in one sense, yes, okay? Yes, we, we, Christians die. And yet, Jesus says, he will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Never, never. Because as you die, you're alive again. That's how it works. That's how it works for the believer. I mean, we see it over and over. When the poor man Lazarus died, as soon as he took his last breath, the angels were like, hey, Laz, come on up. For the believer, we overcome the world's end. The world ends in death. If you know Jesus Christ, you will never die. Never, never die. Isn't that the thing that has the power to take away our fears? All right? And it's only because, it's only because our minds are broken that we forget that. It's because... Our, 
We're just broken sinners. And we forget it and we allow fears to overcome us. But if we could see, if we could just take a, if we could see into the future, if we could see into the future, into your future, you could see it 1,000 years from now, you would say, there's nothing for me to be afraid of if you belong to Jesus, if you know Christ. You would say, there's nothing for me to be afraid of. Why was I afraid? What a fool I was in my life to be so afraid of everything, to be afraid of the future, to be afraid of what's going to happen. And if you know Jesus, you don't have to be afraid because Christ has overcome the world for us. And we belong to him. So we overcome the world's temptations. We overcome the world's hatred. We overcome the world's end. John Yates wrote about this in the 1890s. He said, On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array, let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray, salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about, the earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with our shout. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hill of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus conquering name faith is the victory faith is the victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world amen and so we have that faith we have that victory if we trust in Jesus but the worldly man the unbeliever if the believer overcomes the world by faith the unbeliever is absolutely overcome by the world through his lack of faith in Christ. The unbeliever is overcome by the world's temptations. He cannot help it because he belongs to the world. He believes the world's lie that the world can give him something that it absolutely cannot give. The unbeliever is overcome by the world's hatred. I remember a time in my own life when I thought that Christians were just idiots. That they were wasting their lives. I would never say it. I was too polite for that at that time. But I did believe it. As a matter of fact, I just thought that they were all ignoramuses. I was, if I was really pressed, I, I think I could say that I hated what they stood for. I was overcome by the world's hatred. And the unbeliever is overcome by the world's end. Because the mind of the simple man is death, and their life will end in death. And then they will have to face the, even the second death. Oh, God forbid if there's even any person in this room that is in that condition and state right now. But you would turn and believe. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is our advocate. He's our Savior. He says in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And we can believe his testimony because of who it is that is giving the testimony, because he is God. Listen, John's going to tell us sometimes, you know, we listen to the testimony of man, and we might take it or leave it, but it's not just man that's testifying about these things. God himself testifies about them. Look at verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Amen. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. Okay, so in verse 9, John tells us that we can have confidence because the testimony upon which our faith is built is not only from men, it is from God himself. 
The testimony is greater than any man's. And if we don't believe him, then we make him out to be a liar, something which he cannot do. Look at verses 6 to 8 one more time. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, the Spirit is the truth, because there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Okay, so, scholars debate the meaning of these verses, and even what the original autograph contained, but I believe that the evidence for the understanding of of this particular text is this. Water signifies Jesus' baptism, all right? The water testifies. I'll get to that in a second. Blood signifies Jesus' death on the cross. And the Spirit testifies. Now, the Spirit testifies to us about who God is and what He has given us through the prophets in the Old Testament and through the apostles in the New Testament. And all the Word of God is breathed out by God. He's the one who testifies to us. And then the water also testifies. So, When Jesus was baptized, what happened? Do you remember there was a voice from heaven? Came out of heaven. The Spirit came down, rested on Jesus, and then a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Water of His baptism testifies as to who He is. The blood of His cross testifies. What does the blood say? It says a better word than the blood of Abel. That's what the author of Hebrews says. The blood testifies. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The blood testifies. Forgiveness to us. Reconciliation. New life. There are these three. The testimony of God. Look at verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his son. And so what John is saying is this. It's like, well, those people who when God spoke out of heaven, he's speaking, he's saying, this is my son. And what do the unbelievers who are standing there say? Oh, it's thundering outside. Oh, where's the, looks like a storm is coming. Wait a second, thundering outside? Didn't you just hear what God himself said about his son? They are unwilling to hear. They don't want to hear his voice. God himself says, this is my son. I love him. Listen to him. I am well pleased with him. They refuse to listen. They make God out to be a liar. They don't want to hear God's words. But if you believe, then you have this testimony in yourself. What is the testimony? Look at verse 11. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Look at this. This is God's testimony. God Himself is speaking now. You want to hear God's voice, you want to hear God's testimony. All right? You really, really wish that God would just speak audibly right now. He would just speak to me right now. Listen, listen to His words. He's about to speak to you. You ready? You ready? Here it is. This is a testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Amen? Amen. Do you hear God's voice? See it through the Scripture. Listen to His words given to us through the scripture. Don't listen because some guy in a tie is up here talking to you. Listen because God himself reveals it to you in his holy, divinely inspired word. He says it. If you have the Son, you have life. There is no greater confidence. There is nothing else that I or anybody else can say to you, if you don't receive that, all right, if you don't receive that, then I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Then repent. Repent and start listening to God. This is the confidence. This is the, the assurance that John has been over and over repeating and trying to give to each one of us who believe. 
God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. Oh, there's so much marvelous, wondrous, beautiful truth in these verses. I'm scarcely able to contain my exposition to the time I have left. In just six verses, the word testify or testimony is used eight times. If you go to court and someone is on trial, and someone else gives a testimony. That is the thing by which the jury will determine guilty or innocent. All right? They will make their decision based upon the testimony. And here we see the word testimony, 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 eight times, eight times in six verses. Testimony. This is God speaking, giving his testimony to us. Listen to it again. Listen. Listen to the voice of God. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. This life is in His Son. The one testifying, He is the one testifying to this stupendous truth. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have a son does not have life. In the second verse of this epistle, John refers to Jesus whom he calls the eternal life. And now he says that we have the privilege of being partakers of that life if we have him. Of course, this is the case. Christ is the author of life. It was John who recorded his words in John chapter 10, starting at verse 7. Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, he says it now. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so, John's objective has been to give believers assurance. He does it in this way here. First, he tells us to believe God's own testimony. Can't be clearer than that. Believe God's own testimony. If you don't, you make him out to be a liar. Second, he says that this eternal life is already ours if we have Christ. He already gave us eternal life. Whoever has a son has life. Not will have life, but we have it now. And it will continue. If you trust in Christ, the life you have will continue forever. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Third, if we have eternal life and have crossed over from death to life, then we do not ever need to be afraid of losing it. And so those Christians who, with good intention, wrongfully say that a person can lose their eternal life, I say they are speaking out of both sides of their mouth. Because if someone has something which is eternal, then by definition you cannot lose it. Otherwise it's not eternal life. It's temporary life. It's conditional life. It's something that I had once. I had something eternal. Now I don't have it anymore. No, that's impossible. It doesn't make sense. And you might, might as well not say the word eternal. No, but he says here, we have eternal life. We cannot lose it. And finally, who has this life been given to? Who has it been given to? Look at verse 12. This is maybe the best part of the, the, all these verses right here. What does the word say? The first word in verse 12. Whoever. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. You see, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can have eternal life if you possess God the Son. Whoever. You see, all the things that you've done, God already knows about all of them. It's no secret to Him. It's no secret to Him at all. His eyes see everything. They scan the whole world for all time. He knows everything already. And He still says, because of the magnitude of His amazing grace, He still says, Whoever has the Son 
has life. Are you a whoever? Oh, answer my question now. Are you a whoever? Yes, yes I'm a whoever too, all right? I'm a whoever too, praise God. And so you know what that means? That means that the people who you might think, oh, that person, he's beyond the reach. He's beyond the reach of grace. John here in 1 John rebukes that. Rebukes that kind of thinking. No, no, whoever has the Son has life. I'm so grateful we have a brother here in our congregation that goes out to the prison and preaches the gospel because he knows that those people are whoever's. Those people are. They're in jail. They've done really terrible things. They're in jail probably for good reason, most of them. But they're still a whoever. And if they would just trust in Christ, they also may have that life. John puts it in the starkest terms. It's black and white. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't, though you are currently breathing, you are as good as dead. If you don't have Jesus, you are dead in your sins. That is the stark reality of humanity's fallen condition. And so, I'd like to just close with these words from Ezekiel 18. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all of your transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Oh, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn, turn and live. Turn to Jesus. Let Jesus be the one who is the ruler of your life. Jesus only, in the shadow of the clouds, so chill and dim. We are clinging, loving, trusting, He with us and we with Him. All unseen, though ever nigh, Jesus only, all our cry. Jesus only, in the glory, when the shadows all are flown. Seeing Him in all His beauty, satisfied with Him alone. May we join his ransomed throng, Jesus only, all our song. Let us pray. Oh, Father, I pray that we would believe your words and your testimony about who you are and what you have done for us. Deliver us from the snares of the evil one. Oh, Lord. Help us to claim the victory, the victory that you have already given to us in Christ, who lives forever, who crushes the serpent's head. Deliver your people, Lord. Deliver us from temptations. Deliver us from hatred. Deliver us from the world's end. And give us assurance of eternal life. I'm so grateful for your servant, John. I pray that as we conclude this epistle in two weeks, that it would stay with us the truth of John's words, the holy word of God, would be in our hearts and give us assurance. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.